turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30. Sounds like a good rain out there, doesn't it? Proverbs 30. I want to preach on time to take a bath tonight. It's not even Saturday. Time to take a bath. Some of you may remember years ago, now the youngers will remember Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. But you remember uh, Edgar Bergen was a ventriloquist and Charlie McCarthy was, uh, back then, it, it, it just wasn't known that much. Ventriloquists weren't. And um, it, he had another character, Mortimer Snurd. How many remember Mortimer? Anybody? Oh, yeah, a few of you remember Mortimer. For some reason, I remember him telling the joke where Mortimer says that he got into an elevator and uh, with, there were several people in the elevator and somebody spoke up and said, hmm, somebody's deodorant stopped working. And Mortimer said, well, can't be me. I'm not wearing any. <laughs> and the idea was, of course, that the stink, whatever it was that was in the elevator, could not have come from him, even though it's obvious from the joke that it was. Yes. Well, think about that as you read, beginning in verse 11, we'll read verses 11 through 14 in Proverbs chapter 30. He says, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Notice this generation, our text tonight comes from verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Before we pray, some will think that I perhaps am talking about the generation that is today. But I've got news for you. This generation has been around for a long, long time. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would fill me with the Spirit of God. And may I say the things that you would have me to say. May we, each of us, allow the Holy Ghost of God to search out our own hearts to find those areas where we're not clean. That, dear God, we would be cleansed tonight. Have your way in every life, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's really hard to deal with people who are clean in their own eyes but have not been washed. Now, I guarantee you, for instance, if any preacher would get up and preach a message on gossip, the people would say amen and they would take it seriously, but the one group of people who would not get that it had anything to do with them would be the gossips. It's one of those things. You can preach on pride. And the one group of people that believe that the message had nothing to do for them are the proud. When you read a verse like this, there's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. The ones who think that it doesn't apply to them, that's it. Right there. Because one of the things you learn if you've been saved any length of time at all is that you learn that you need continual cleansing. Amen. You know, one bath doesn't do it. Now, thank God for the washing of the blood that saved me. That took care of that forever. And yet, I am to keep short accounts with God and make sure that I am right with Him. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Yes, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And His word is not in us. Man retaliates when his sins are pointed out to, well, I'm okay. Or it's my parents' fault. They're the reason that I'm like I am. Or society has made me like I am. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm as good 
as anybody else. But the truth is, everybody else has the same problems. Well, I'm as good as those church members, yes, and they need cleansing, and you need cleansing. As long as I follow my heart, I'll be okay. No, the Bible says that it's a fool that trusteth in his own heart. Or as long as I do right in my own eyes, I'll be all right. And yet Proverbs 14, 12 warns us, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In Proverbs 16 and verse 2, he says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Or in Proverbs 21, 2, every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. How many people reject Christ because they don't see their need for Christ? Oh, they'll admit they've sinned once in a while, but after all, so does everybody else. Therefore, they must be okay. How many Christians never grow because they think they're spiritual enough? And yet I read verses in the book of Job. Here's Job, a man that God called a perfect man who loved God and eschewed evil. And in chapter 9 of the book of Job, verses 20 and 21, Job said, If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say that I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. For though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul, I would despise my life. And then later, when he is confronted by God at the end of the book of Job, in chapter 42, verses 5 and 6, Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Of course, God continued to send prophets to Israel because they would constantly go astray in their sin. And as you know, we've been studying on Wednesdays the book of Ezekiel. Uh, honestly, I've read through it, but never as solely as what I've gone through it here in, uh, in these messages on Wednesday. And to me, every message is just so intense. There is so much there. And, I, and then I've been called a negative preacher, but good night alive. Those who call me that have never read the book of Ezekiel and thought about it. I mean, there he just kept hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering. But I'm reminded of Israel's reply to God's preachers. Uh, go to the book of Jeremiah a moment. Jeremiah. And we'll just look at a few verses. And this is repeated several times in the book of Jeremiah alone. But in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verses 22 and 23, the scripture says, For though thou wash thee with niter, and, <clears throat> pardon me, and take thee much soap, Yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary transversing her ways. So verses 34 and 35. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee. Behold, thou sayest, I have not sinned. If for some reason, it's always easy for us to see everybody else's sin. But we are blind to our own. You go over to chapter 5 a moment. And notice beginning in verse 9. He says, Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Go ye up upon her walls and destroy, but make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. In other words, even though God had sent Jeremiah to preach to them about the coming judgment because of their sin, they said, God hasn't sent Jeremiah. He's not describing us. We're okay. We haven't sinned. God's going to end up having Babylon carry them off and destroy their temple and destroy their walls and destroy their city. 
God's going to do all of that because these people refuse to see their sin. It is one of those generations described for us in Proverbs chapter 30. The book of Judges should have been a book of victory. I mean, after all, you go through the book of Joshua and you see how God miraculously uh, moved upon the land and gave Israel victory over the land. So now they have it subdued. They have not taken it all. But at the end of the book of Joshua, every, the, the stage is set for the land flowing with milk and honey to be theirs, to provide for them. God had given them so many promises. All they had to do was keep God's word. And so you get into Judges. And now things are ready. And yet Judges, instead of being a book of enjoying the blessings of God is a book of constant defeat. Because if you just take a look at a number of the verses that are found in the book of Judges, he says, first of all, twice in the book of Judges, chapter 17 and verse 6, chapter 21 and verse 25, he says, and in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was, understand this, right in his own eyes. Now that's a key phrase, right in his own eyes. Now, you don't need to turn to these verses, but I'll just share them with you. Judges chapter 2 and verse 19, they cease not from their stubborn way. Judges chapter 3 and verse 7, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 3, 12, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Judges 4, 1, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 6, 1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 10, 6, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Judges 13, 1, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. And God says they were doing evil in the sight of of the Lord. Uh, let me tell you something. There's a lot of things that we may preach against. May I say, there are a number of churches, of course, that don't have standards anywhere near what we might have at Madison Baptist Church. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think they're doing right in the sight of the Lord or evil in the sight of the Lord? Are they doing right in their eyes or evil in their eyes? They're doing right in their eyes. You see, I don't care what the standards may be. And by the way, I do not believe the standards of Madison Baptist Church are the, the standards that Christians ought to go by. As we get closer to the Lord, we'll have more standards. As I grew in the Lord, I got more standards in my life. As I made decisions from reading the Word of God that certain things need to go from our life, I found that we got closer and closer and closer to the Lord. I don't want to be caught doing that which is right in my own eyes. I want to do right in the eyes of the Lord. I don't want to be a generation that is not cleansed from their own way. They see no problems with themselves. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end are of the ways of death. Now, this is all introduction. I want you to notice uh, some verses. How can people be so self-deceived? We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. But God warns us about that. He says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Every one of us have heart problems. We have a heart problem. It tends toward evil. Genesis 8, 21. For the imaginations of man's heart are is evil from his youth. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, he tells us about the deceitfulness of sin. The more you get into sin, the less it looks bad. There are things on the TV today that would not have been on the TV 30 years ago. As a matter of fact, the TV stations and the networks would have lost their license and faced big fines for having the garbage and the filth that they have on it. But I'll tell you, that, how did that happen? Uh, we got used to it. As a people, we got used to it. So now they can even put on the TVs the very worst of language. And they know that the people will take it. 
And if anybody uh, complains about it, uh, puts out a complaint against it, they are the ones that are ostracized instead of the people that are doing it. Now, that's just the way that it is. Now, not only is sin itself deceitful, Ephesians 4, 17 and 18, he says this, I say therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the darkness of their heart. We have gotten to the place where we have accepted in religious circles, in quote-unquote Christian or non, uh, nominally Christian circles, we have accepted all kinds of sin as being okay. Now, although it's not acceptable here, but for instance, I can guarantee you that there were numbers of churches in our area today that he had females come to the church, not just in short skirts, but in yoga pants as their outer garment. There's no way that's modest. There's no way in the world that's right. We have become like the people in Jeremiah's day. They can no longer blush. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. See, there's a generation that are right in their own eyes. But the problem is they have not been washed. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 uh, tells us, if our, or verses 3 and 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hidden unto them which are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, he says, And this is the condemnation, that men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. When man is confronted with his sin, he makes one of two choices. He will either deny it as being sin, because he doesn't see what's wrong with it, or he will get right about it. Proverbs 28, 13. Get this. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. You might ask, well, how does man try to cover up his sinful acts? I believe we see three examples of this in the book of Luke. On how man tries to cover up his sinful acts. Go over to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and let me read beginning in verse 25. Of course, we're picking it up uh, really in the middle of a number of events that are taking place. But notice in verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law, and how readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, now underline this, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who's my neighbor? What do they do, preacher? They plead ignorance. In other words, he's saying, You know, since I really don't know who my neighbor is, therefore, it's okay. I know a lot of people that are hoping, hoping that their ignorance, or at least their pretended ignorance of the speed limit, will get them out of a speeding ticket when they're finally stopped. They plead ignorance. Somehow, they think that ignorance is going to make what they do all right. They plead ignorance. People try to cover up their need for salvation by claiming ignorance. Uh, so many in church will cry, well, how do I know what's right? Well, are you going to get your standard for right and wrong from the Internet? Are you going to get it from the web blogs? If that be the case, which web blog are you going to get it from? Yeah. Or are you going to get it from the Scripture? Are you going to get into the Scripture? Let me tell you something. I'm not always right, but the book's always right. I mean, the reality is... We've got a book that is true from beginning to end, and that takes care of anything. Uh, somebody will say, uh, but there are so many interpretations of the Bible. The Bible doesn't need to be interpreted. It just needs to be read and believed. He wrote it like he meant it. Of course, if you're not going to use the right Bible, you don't know what the Bible's saying. I mean, you've got a lot of nonsense out there with some of these so-called things. To, I, how about the Ebonics Bible? Now they've got a cowboy Bible. 
I mean, they've got Bibles for every different group, and there's a lot of problems with those. We've talked about that some lately, about them having the wrong, taken from the wrong text, uh, the wrong method of translation, and so on. But nevertheless, what does it clearly say? When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. What does that say? He's the way. doesn't say he's a way. says he's the way. There are people who want to say, well, we're all trying to get to God. We're just going different ways. No, Jesus says, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. He said, I am the way, the truth. The life, now get this, this isn't hard, this isn't difficult. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Is anybody going to get to heaven if they don't come through Jesus Christ? No, that's plain. That's plain. All right, forget about some of those verses you may not understand at all. You surely understand that one. When the Bible gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, and he lays it out very plain. He says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What's the gospel? You can't get any plainer than that. How can you not understand that? He died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day. According to the scripture, that's plain. How about when Peter says in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Only one name saves. That's the name of Jesus Christ. Muhammad doesn't and cannot save. Confucius doesn't, cannot save. Buddha doesn't, cannot save. All the Hindu gods put together can't save one soul. It's only in the name of Jesus. You see, the problem is not that they can't understand it. They don't like what it says clearly. And they want to put some kind of spin on it to say something else. Romans 6.23 declares this, For the wages of sin is death. He says, but the gift, what is a gift? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, we know what wages are. That's You have to define wages. You work for something, you've earned it. If you pay for something, you've bought it. What about a gift? A gift is purchased by somebody else and you just receive it. Salvation, eternal life was purchased by Jesus Christ. And he offers it to you as a gift. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. You can't pay for it. You just receive it. Period. That's it. See, it's not hard to understand. I mean, boy, people, it's, it's only hard because they want it to say something other than what it says. You say, well, preacher, how do I know there's a hell? Do you believe what Jesus said about it? Jesus preached more on hell than any other person in the Scripture. He preached more graphically about hell than any other person in the Scripture. When he talks about the rich man and and the beggar Lazarus, he says it came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried in hell. He lift up his eyes being in torments. And then we have the description. He cries out to Abraham about sending Lazarus. They may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. For he's tormented in the flame. You have the whole discussion that goes on there. I remember preaching on that when I was preaching up just south of Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, there was a young man who came in with uh, a Bible. I don't know what Bible college he was going to. And he says, "Uh, Brother Allison, I, I believe that that's a parable. I said, why would you believe that? Jesus doesn't say it's a parable. So why would you believe it's a parable? I said, as a matter of fact, not only does Jesus not say it's a parable, there's no story, no parable that Jesus gave that he ever named any of the people in the parable. Never, not one time. So what would make you think that's a parable? It's not a parable, it's true. Jesus said it. And you look at the other descriptions that Jesus gives about hell, that ought to be, oh, don't you know that's just the grave? Or are you telling me then that people are waking up in those caskets? Maybe the night of the living dead is a true story, huh? 
No, sir. They're not waking up in the grave. Their body goes to the grave. They go to hell. And they burn forever. And there is no escape. They're not getting out. That's plain. The thing is, you get some Bible college students who want to want to have something that they can tickle the ears of people. Oh, I read so-and-so, and Dr. So-and-so said it's a parable. Well, Dr. Jesus didn't. And I'm going to believe what Jesus had to say, not when some doctor who simply wrote a book trying to deny the very things that Jesus taught. By the way, even if it was a parable, a parable was, taught, was given to teach a central truth. And here's a central truth. You die and go to hell, you burn forever and you're not getting out. Nobody can get you out. Even if it wasn't a parable, you can't get away from the message. John 3, 18, Jesus said, He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In Revelation 21, 8, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now you know how they try to get around that? Oh, you're just a fire and brimstone preacher. No, I'm just giving you what the Bible says. I mean, it's clear. You see, the real problem with them is it's not that they don't understand what it's saying. The real problem is they don't like what it's saying. They want it to say something else. And so they simply deny the clear truth. People plead ignorance to stay away from Christ. And Christians plead ignorance in order to remain in their sin. They'll say something like, well, I'm not convicted about it yet. And what does that change? Uh, Is it a matter if we can get enough people not convicted about something, then God didn't mean it? Is that what that means? We want to cross the railroad tracks, but there's a train coming. Hey, we want to get across the tracks. We don't want to have to wait here. So let's all stand here on the tracks. Just, just... Just believing that it's not really coming. That's stupidity. Well, of course it is. I still remember the story of Brother Dan Carr. Brother Dan Carr pastored Tennessee Ridge Baptist Church. A few pastors before I pastored Tennessee Ridge Baptist Church. And he got up one Sunday morning and he said, at that time, by the way, the miniskirt craze was just becoming popular to the place where the churches, I'm talking about even independent Baptist churches, were picking it up. And their females were wearing mini skirts, you know, skirts two, three, four, five inches above their knees. And uh, he got up and he said, listen, he said, now I'm going to preach on this matter of mini skirts. I, I want you to know that uh, there are some of you who are pleading ignorant. Well, I'm going to give you what the Bible has to say about this kind of immodesty. And uh, I, you, if you allow your daughters to wear mini skirts after today... You'll no longer be ignorant. You'll just be immoral. Well, that got him in a lot of trouble with some people. Where they sought to run him off because of what he had said. But see, they didn't like the clear truth about that. Listen, there are all kinds of churches people can go to. We're going to cover it up because more important to them is not you being right with God. More important to them is that you keep putting your money in the offering plate. That's really what it comes down to. Now, let's go ahead and give this. I haven't done this in a while. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is, this is so plain to me. I don't know how in the world. I mean, you, you got to really claim to be super stupid to not get this. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. He makes a very plain statement. He says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? What? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. What's he talking about? Next verse. Flee fornication. How'd you get that? Flee fornication. Fleeing fornication doesn't mean standing up next to it and staying there. Flee means get out of there. 
Flee fornication. You realize Christians aren't supposed to go every place. There are some places you just don't go because you're a Christian. Notice, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now that messes up a lot of preaching right there. Because you see, eating something made with white sugar is not a sin against the body. Eating something made with white flour is not a sin against the body. Drinking a Coca-Cola may not be good for you, but it's not a sin against the body. What's the sin against the body? What does he say very plainly? Fornication. Now that's just plain. I mean, how can you not get that? But then he goes on to say, What? Know know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God and you're not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now I know we've got a chapter division here, but you understand when the Bible was given, we didn't have chapter divisions. They didn't come around till about a thousand years later. He's not done talking about fornication, and I can prove it to you. After he lays the groundwork for this argument, he says, Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless, to avoid what? He's not changed the subject. He's still talking about fornication. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Now listen, that's as plain as day. I mean, you've really got to count yourself as being stupid not to get what it's saying. See, I don't like that word stupid. I don't much care for it either. But as that famous American said, stupid is as stupid does. Now, wait a second. You say, well, preacher, he doesn't say it's a sin to touch. Now, wait. Look what it says again. It is good for a man. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. All right. It doesn't say there it's a sin. It says it's good not to do it. But James tells us in James 4, 17, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? Oh, my. It is to sin. Well, pastor, you and I just disagree. No, your problem's not with me. You can't get off by saying you disagree with the pastor. Your problem's not the pastor. Your problem's God. God wrote it. He wrote it clear so anyone can understand it. By the way, it just makes sense. If you don't touch, you'll never commit fornication. Once you start touching, the desire is for more. One kiss isn't enough. You want more. And with a few kisses, you want more from the hugging and the squeezing, and I'm not going on with the rest of it. I think, I mean, this is a bright enough crowd to understand exactly what he's saying. You can't plead ignorance. God wrote the book plain. You just got to be able to think. What about modesty? Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Notice, he says, in verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, or pearls, or costly array, but that which becometh, but which becometh women, professing godliness with good works. You know, in the book of Proverbs, he talks about the attire of a harlot. There's a big difference between the attire of a harlot and women who profess godliness. There is a gigantic difference between the attire of a harlot. And what do you think female dress is supposed to be more like? Those who profess godliness. All right, right, keep your hand here. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. This is good stuff now. In 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, He says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, 
whose adorning. Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of a pair, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. If you're really godly on the inside, it ought to show on the outside. As a matter of fact, I personally believe that what you show on the outside tells everyone exactly what's on the inside. Parents, we have a responsibility to teach our daughters godly dress. They're not going to be wearing short skirts. It is absolutely embarrassing. We end up dressing little girls like men and then wonder why they can't sit down in a dress without showing things they shouldn't be showing. Now, the Bible's plain, uh, and I am sick and tired of hearing people profess some kind of ignorance about that. Listen, the Bible is plain. Amen. Why don't you become a Bible believer and become a man or a godly lady and stand up for God? First Thessalonians 5.22, he says we're to avoid all appearance of evil. So first of all, they do it by pleading ignorance. Secondly, they do it by attacking their words. Notice over in Luke chapter 16. Let's go back to Luke, Luke chapter 16. There is a generation that appear in their own eyes, and they are not washed. In Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 14, notice the scripture says this, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided Jesus. They derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now here they are. They were justifying themselves before men, and they were an abomination in the sight of God. They were deriding the Lord Jesus Christ, and the things that he had just said. Go back to chapter 15. Notice in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Like that was a bad thing. What are they doing? They're attacking him with their words. The Holy Spirit had put the pressure on them, so they attacked the messenger. They attacked his practice in chapter 15. Chapter 16, they attacked his person. Why? Because if you can make the other fellow look bad, then you don't look so bad. That's what it's about. That's what the Jews continually sought to do with Jesus. Tried to make him look bad. They accused him of all kinds of things that were not true. But you throw... I remember we had a lady... It said, you know, if you throw enough manure on somebody, you're going to have an awful lot on, it yourself, on you yourself. You're going to stink just like it. That's why I guess politics is so dirty today. So they attacked his practice. They attacked his person. All the lost die and go to hell. You know, if I sin, it doesn't change their judgment. You know, if I'm not everything that I ought to be, it doesn't change what's going to happen to them. You get that? They're still going to die and go to hell. And say, well, preacher, I think you yell too much in the pulpit. Okay, that may be. I don't know. I try to be the preacher that God may be and try to be faithful to the word of God. But let's say that you never should yell when you preach. Even though the scripture says, cry aloud, spare not. But I don't believe you should yell. All right. Uh, you die and go to hell if you don't take Christ as Savior, and if you use the excuse you don't like a yelling preacher, that's not going to make hell one, one degree less hot for you. Or one minute shorter. You're still going to be there from now on. You better get it settled. I talked to a man who didn't go to church. He said that there were some hypocrites in the church, so that's why he didn't go. My Bible says in Proverbs 28, 9, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Even his prayer shall be abomination. If he makes a conscious choice not to hear the word. We're not talking about somebody in the hospital that can't get up and go. 
We can't talk about somebody that's immobilized, but somebody who could easily go, they could be there, hear the word of God. He says, their prayer is an abomination. God's saying, we need to hear his, hear word, his, we need to hear his word more than he needs to hear our words. Amen. His word is far more important. Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. No man that didn't come to church, and he said the former pastor said something to a friend and wouldn't come. By the way, don't, don't believe everything you hear a friend say that some other preacher may have said. I'll guarantee you, you don't know the context in which it was said. You don't know how it was meant. All you know is this person's interpretation of what was said. And if they're not favorable to the preacher, obviously it's not going to be a good comment. We choose who to believe, don't we? I mean, listen, right now our country is being divided on the shot. We're not being divided on the pandemic. We're being divided on the shot. We've all got our own opinion. Who's right? We'll find out one day. Isn't that right? Depends which sources you believe. It's hard to believe people that have constantly lied to you, but, you know, and I didn't put that one in one camp or another. I just want you to know. Young people don't like their parents' rules, so they find fault with their parents, and they think somehow that excuses them. Here they are, a rebel. And, by the way, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, the word of God says. So they go to their friends, run down their parents because they think that makes them look cooler. That makes them look better. They surely are smarter than their parents. And, I mean, they're such perfect little angels. But, you know, it's never because they want to stand for God. They want to stand against the word of God. And so they try to make their, their parents look as bad as what they can to justify themselves. Number one, they plead ignorance. Number two, they attack the words with words. Number three, they cover up their works. Go over to Luke chapter 18 and with this we'll close. Luke chapter 18. You've got a Pharisee and a publican that are praying. Notice verse 9. He spake this parable. Now this is a parable right here. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God. I love the way that's put. He didn't say he prayed thus with God. He says he prayed thus with himself, God. You hear what he was calling himself? Because he was his own God. He had not accepted God's work. So he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee, I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Sounds like deacon material. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted themselves shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Now, you hear what he's saying. This man tried to cover up his disobedience of heart to God by calling out his works. Do you remember when Jesus talked on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. What are they doing? They're talking about their works. But Jesus said, I'll say unto them, depart from me, ye wicked. I never knew you. You don't get to heaven by your works. I mean, there are a lot of people who go to church, put money in the church, give money to church functions, give money to local charities. They do all that, but they've never been born again. And when they die, they will burn in hell for eternity. Their works will not purchase them one square inch of heaven. Won't get them anywhere close to heaven. You must be born again. Some kids think because they went to a Christian school, that makes them good Christians. I've known kids that thought because they were homeschooled, that put them above all others. Well, I got news for you. I've seen godly kids and reprobates come out of the public schools. 
I've seen godly kids and reprobates come out of Christian schools. And I've seen godly kids and reprobates come out of home schools. You are not the product of your school. You're the product of your home. Going to a Christian school doesn't make you a good Christian, doesn't even make you a Christian. Going to a, being homeschooled doesn't make you a good Christian and doesn't make you a godly Christian. The truth is, you better humble yourself and be obedient unto God. Oh man, I know, this just, uh, how in the world? I got news for you. Moses came out of the Egyptian schools and he did just fine. All the kids brought up in the Jewish homes, they weren't the deliverers. Moses was the deliverer, brought up in the Egyptian school. I'm not arguing for the public school system. I hope you understand that. Some church, church people think like this. Well, hey, I'm a deacon. Oh, I tithe. Well, I came out on work day. I work on the bus. I've taught Sunday school class. I'm not as bad as other people. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth or forsaketh it shall have mercy. So what should we do? According to Revelation chapter 2 and 3 to all seven of the churches, he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We've got to be willing to hear it for what it says. We've got to take the Bible for exactly what it says. Now, the lost must be willing to hear what the Spirit of God speaks to their heart. And we have to be willing to hear what the Spirit of God says to the church. But it's going to come from the same word of God. By the way, what does the Spirit say to the churches? Well, right here is everything he says to the churches. Right here. This is God's word. Church at Laodicea or that Ephesus thought they were pretty good. God even, Jesus even gave them a rundown of their works. They all look good. But he said, I have somewhat against thee. You've left your first love. Therefore, remember from whence thou art fallen, repent and do thy first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick from thee. To the last church, the church of Laodiceans, they thought, hey, we're rich and increasing good. We're pretty good. And he said, you don't know, but you are poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. And then he tells them to repent in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You see, there's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Well, how do we get clean? That if shalt, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, you know, yeah, I had Greek in Bible college and seminary and I had, I had Hebrew in Bible college and seminary. Uh, and listen, that's good. I, I, God picked Hebrew and Greek for a reason to begin to give us the word of God. And thank God, I believe he has preserved his word for us, English-speaking people in the King James Bible. I believe he has done that. That verse is very plain. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you see, I mentioned the Greek a moment ago. The Greek word that is translated confess is not just tell what you've done. It is the word homo logeo, Homo means the same. Logeo means to speak. The word itself means to say the same thing about your sin that God says about your sin. If you're not willing to call your sin what it is, and if you want a lesson in that, just read David's confession in Psalm 51. Man, he takes full blame for it. He calls his sin every wicked thing that he could call that. I mean, he goes through it. He takes credit for all of his sin. When we confess our sin like that to get right with God, then we will be cleansed. Let's not be a generation. A generation that is unwashed from their sins. They're not washed from their filthiness. And we just walk around pure in our own eyes. So we close with 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal the land. I'm still holding out, Brother Weeks, for a revival. I don't believe God's holding it back. He's waiting for God's people to get honest with him. 
and want to be washed. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Take your word, deal with our hearts. There's some listening over the internet. God, they get down right where they're at in their living room or wherever they're watching the the, uh, broadcast from and get right with you. I pray here in the auditorium, your people won't wait, but come and get right with you. For any of them are lost, we pray they'd come and get this matter settled about being, being saved, knowing Christ as Savior. But Lord, you have your way in every heart. For I beg it in Jesus' name.